Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. I want to welcome back to the program Trita Parsi. He is the Executive Vice President at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Trita, the last time we spoke, it was about two or three months ago. Um, I, uh, I guess it was maybe just in the days uh, following October 7th. Um, and I don't remember exactly how we titled it, but we talked about, I know that we spoke about the threat of this war going regional. And um, when we booked you, we were going to talk about, you know, both that happening, but also, you know, pieces you wrote about the the implications of Biden's, I mean, really unfettered support for the wor- the most excessive response by the Israelis possible, it seems to me, uh, and how that's going to implicate his um, reelection, what it means for our democracy. But uh, over the past 36 hours, maybe it's been 48 hours. Uh, there's been developments that suggest that um, uh, w- we should start with the regionalizing of this war. Why don't you uh, give us this timeline of what has happened? And it seems to me it started with the announcement that the Israelis were going to uh, pull back. I think it was five brigades uh, from Gaza in, 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 in for unclear reasons. Yes, yeah, so that, that did happen. Uh, but I think we have to go back perhaps another 10 days or so. We saw the assassination of an Iranian general in Damascus, in Syria. We had the assassination of a senior Hamas leader in Beirut just about 36 hours ago. There is this massive explosion. The Iranians call it a terrorist attack taking place in the city of Kerman in Iran today that has left more than 100 dead. We do not know if this is linked or not. The timing, of course, is suspicious. There are other potential culprits for attacks of this kind have happened before in Iran. But this is the deadliest terrorist attack in Iran's modern history. All of these different things, and again, potentially excluding the latest one, uh, what happened in in Kermak, nevertheless seems to suggest that the Israelis are starting to act on what they wanted to do apparently from the beginning, which is to expand the war, to go into Lebanon as well. The Biden administration credits themselves of having talked the Israelis out of it immediately after October 7th. And uh, as of recent, we have heard more and more concern from the Biden administration that the Israelis may be looking for a pretext to expand the war. I think we're seeing it quite clearly uh, because the likelihood of these attacks having been done either to provoke uh, a response from Hezbollah or from the IRGC in in Syria, or to actually lay the preparation for uh, a broadening of the war, I think starts to become increasingly clear. Why would the Israelis want this though? I mean, this is the logical question. I personally did not believe that the Israelis wanted a widened war in the early days of the war, thinking that it would be too difficult for them to handle two fronts at the same time. But I think something has changed in Israel since the October 7th attacks. The Israeli calculation essentially was that they could manage living next to Hamas uh, and what they perceived as the threat from Hamas, of course. Um, uh, and, you know, they had the strategy of what they call mowing the lawn, bombing Gaza every two years or so. They did not expect that there could be such an attack from Hamas. And there was. And now they extrapolated that into Lebanon and saying, how could Israel possibly calculate that it could manage living next to Hezbollah, which is much more powerful than Hamas is. This is simply unacceptable, the argument goes, just as much as Hamas needs to be eliminated from uh, uh, Gaza in order for Israel to be safe. Hezbollah also has to be eliminated, at least from the uh, southern parts of Lebanon, in order for Israel to be safe. And then essentially saying they they have no choice but to expand the war. Then you add another dimension to which goes exactly to what you said earlier on. This has been the most deferential president uh, uh, in the United States to an Israeli war effort that we've seen in in a very, very long time. Um, uh, And as a result, perhaps there is a perception on the Israeli side that, yes, the United States doesn't want an expansion of the war. The Biden administration has pushed back against it. But if Israel manages to provoke an attack from IRGC or from uh, Lebanon onto Israel, then the Biden administration will fall into line just as it did after the Hamas attack 
and end up supporting uh, Israel's expansion of the war into Lebanese territory. I, I want to uh, circle back to that that dynamic in, in a moment, but can you just uh, give us a brief rundown of exactly like, and 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 to, and to be honest, I haven't, uh, I I don't know that I've even contemplated this in a, a decade, but who like who runs Lebanon? Like a, the, like what is is there even a Lebanese government per se? I know there is no sort of uh, 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 one formal, you know, uh, uh, prime minister. But w what is the dynamic in Lebanon? And what are the implications of an assassination of, uh, of a Hamas leader in Beirut? Like, w w how would that provoke Hezbollah? To what extent would it broke, uh, provoke Hezbollah? Like, what are the dynamics there? But first, give us that, that sort of like overlay of Lebanon, if you, might, if you would. So Lebanon has been in both an economic and political crisis for quite some time now um, and, and not been able to uh, uh, come to a consensus on a political leadership, particularly uh, specific uh, leadership positions. Uh, and, and the country has been deadlocked. There was a bit of a hope that after the Saudi Iranian normalization, that that would actually help unbreak um, uh, some of the deadlock uh, in Lebanon politically. So what has remained is one of the, if not the most powerful political grouping in Lebanon. But Hezbollah is also an organization that is working very hard to prove that it is a Lebanese organization and not just an Iranian proxy uh, in the eyes of many Lebanese who do see it as just an extension of Iran. So Nasrallah's red line that he put forward only a week or two after uh, the Gaza war broke out was that Hezbollah would not get involved in the war unless there was an attack on Lebanon beyond what we what is a normal, unfortunately, normal skirmishes that takes place between um, uh, Israel and Lebanon. Um, and the question is, will Hezbollah define this latest attack, which goes into Beirut? We're not talking about a border skirmish here um, as a breach of that red line. Will it view it as a breach of Lebanese? Uh, sovereignty and as a result uh, necessitate a Lebanese response? Does it see it as an attack on Hamas and as a result believe that this is Hamas's responsibility to respond? It's not entirely clear, but the statement that Hezbollah issued yesterday seemed to indicate that as much as it sees it as an attack on Lebanon, as much as it sees that it as some form of response is necessary and inevitable, the last lines of the statement talked about uh, patience and that more glorious days will follow, which seems to indicate that Hezbollah is sticking to the long game that it and Iran is playing vis-a-vis -vis Israel, which is they don't want an open warfare because it's too costly to them. It's a trap in their view that Israel wants because Israel is the one that would benefit from open warfare. Iran and Hezbollah would not. Whether they can sustain that approach, the discipline that requires to uh, have that approach remains to be seen. I fear that we're getting closer and closer and closer to the moment in which there will be um, uh, some form of uh, response that will spark uh, a much larger. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can go ahead, Sam. Well, is, is, is the fact that they, I mean, because Hezbollah has a much, like, as, as far as I understand it, two somewhere between two and three uh, times the size of fighting force that Hamas is. It is, um, it has more sophisticated weaponry than Hamas does. Um, it is from, from the perspective of Hezbollah, they are, they thinking like right now is peak sort of like Israel has peak leverage over the United States, because it seems to me if Hezbollah was to go in and um, have any type of like beyond the more banal uh, uh, skirmish on the border that they occasionally trade rocket fire. But if there was something more extensive in terms of response, based upon Joe Biden's logic that he has used in terms of basically saying to the Israelis, you know, don't do this, don't do that, but here's the money to do it. Here's the weaponry to do it. There's no logical, there's no way that Joe Biden could be consistent 
in the event that Hezbollah uh, launched an attack on Israel of, of any magnitude, consistent in by saying, don't do this. And in fact, it, it, the U.S. would probably have to be even in a greater supportive role in that attack. I, I mean, is, is that essentially the dynamic? I believe so. I, I think that once there is um, a much more significant exchange of fire between Israel and Lebanon, the U.S. will be forced um, or Biden will choose to go step in in support of Israel. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean, however, that the United States is going to be actively involved in the war itself through that arena. But because of other dynamics in the region, we now have uh, plenty of attacks by Iraqi and Syrian militias against U.S. troops. We have attacks in the Red Sea by the Houthis. Mm. You add those dimensions to it, and then the U.S. itself gets directly attacked with American casualties. Then you're looking at a scenario in which the United States very much, very likely would get dragged into the war uh, in, in a much more a comprehensive way, not just supporting Israel, uh, but actually actively in the in the fighting. The U.S. itself has made it very clear that it will strike uh, lethally. It already has against attacks by these Iraqi militias. Um, but I, I think if we take a look at the history of this, it's quite interesting. Uh, between January 2021 and March 2023, there were about 80 attacks by Iraqi and Syrian militias against U.S. troops. Between October 7th and today, there's been more than 100, just in 10, 11 years. The only six days during this period in which there weren't any attacks was when there was a ceasefire in Gaza. The day before the ceasefire, there were six attacks on US troops. I think we see a very clear picture. If there is a ceasefire, you will have uh, an end to the attacks by the Iraqi militias you will likely have a significant reduction of Houthi attacks. In fact, there was a significant reduction of Houthi attacks against ships in the Red Sea during the ceasefire. You will probably also have a calming down of the border between Israel and Lebanon, and most likely no response by the Iranians to um, uh, any attack that the Israelis may or may not have. So it seems to me that the most obvious way of actually getting a de-escalation and making sure that the United States does not get dragged into this war is the one way that the Biden administration is most adamant about not pursuing, and that's a season. Yes, and I, you know, so to bring it back to this attack that we do not know the origins of in Iran, um, five days ago, former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett took out an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal, um, which has been very pro-Israel, I would say, and it's uh, just conventional reporting and then, of course, in its, its right-wing opinion pages. Um, but Naftali Bennett is one of the two top options considered if an election were to be called, uh, which Netanyahu is aggressively trying to avoid, to replace Netanyahu as prime minister in that time. Um, you know, five days before, he took out this opinion piece, and then we're seeing the attack, uh, or I guess I guess that was on uh, Christmas, the assassination of the Iranian general by Israel. Um, and then whatever the origins of this bombing are, we don't necessarily know. But to your point about how uh, the Israeli government does wants to basically uh, move towards potentially that broader regional conflict with Iran, um, and they want there to be provocation, is it your assessment that there is a drive within the Israeli government to continue to tie um, when they uh, fight with Hezbollah or when they speak about the Houthis and their uh, alignment with Iran and their rocket attacks into Israel um, to continue to bring it back to Iran to convince U.S. Uh, neocons essentially that this is necessary that we need to bring us into a larger war and then what is Iran's response to that I, I think you're absolutely right yes there is that desire there's also some truth in it you know Iran is arming um, Hamas it has armed uh, and trained the Houthis it is definitely behind Hezbollah so there is a constellation there uh, the issue where it gets a little bit dicey is 
when the Israelis claim that they have evidence that Iran had a hand, for instance, uh, in a specific attack, although they didn't say that about the uh, attacks on Hamas uh, by Hamas uh, at first, but because that's different if they were actively involved. But there's no doubt that the Iranians have been supporting these different groups. But it comes to a, a larger question here, which is from the Israeli standpoint, there's been more, there's been an effort for more than 20 years now to get the United States to attack Iran. Uh, viewing uh, an attack on Iran by the Israelis as necessary, uh, by the United States as necessary in order to be able to shift the balance of power back into Israel's favor, really uh, cut down Iran in size several notches, eliminate much of its network, uh, and create a, a military balance that is much more favorable to Israel. This has been going on for 20 years. Again and again, the Israelis have pushed it. Again and again, is American presidents have pushed back. Even Bush pushed back. Obama, of course, pushed back. It's actually very funny. Even Trump pushed back uh, uh, initially uh, and said, well, you know, if you want to have war with Iran, you should go ahead and do it yourself, but keep the United States out of it. The only time you actually saw that the Trump was more open to Netanyahu's pressure for attacking Iran was after the elections, when Trump thought that the only way that he could overturn the elections was starting a war. So we see very clearly Trump favors war when he thinks that it benefits him politically, not for other reasons. But Although, so you have this history. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just mean that it, this was also on the fourth anniversary of the assassination of Soleimani, which was one of Trump's first acts. So you can see that there are folks within, you know, the, the Pentagon and in the government here that are influential, that are going to be sympathetic to these kinds of claims. Certainly, certainly. And, and again, it, it goes back to show that, look, there's been this effort by the Israelis for uh, 20 plus years. They may calculate now that they have the best opportunity yet to be able to bring in the United States into such a war to take from their perspective in a manner that Israel itself cannot do because of the degree to which Biden has been beer hugging Netanyahu and have been so deferential to Netanyahu. I don't think Netanyahu has ever uh, experience a president that under these circumstances has been so deferential to its 